Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben. Welcome to episode 328 of the podcast. It's January 15th, 2019. I pause because I must say 2018. We're into the new year. Welcome to the first episode of the year. We've got a lot of great episodes coming up. Um, over the next uh, month or two, and I'm sure throughout the year, uh, to give you a preview of some upcoming episodes. I've interviewed uh, Christoph Rozier, a a professor from Germany, who's going to talk about his grand tour of Japanese auto plants. We'll talk with Jason Burt about his experience getting coached by Toyota and their TSSC organization. We'll talk with Dr. Eric Dixon, the CEO of UMass Memorial Medical Center, about their lean journey and uh, how they engage employees try to engage everybody in continuous improvement. We'll talk with Jean-Marc Legentel and Marc Olivier Legentel about their book, The Toyota Kata Memory Jogger. And I'll also soon be recording an interview with Mike Eisenberg, the director and producer of an upcoming documentary called To Air is Human about patient safety. So we'll have a wide range of topics, a lot of really interesting guests, and I look forward to what else uh, is going to come here in 2019. So if you haven't already, I hope you will subscribe to the podcast. You can find uh, the library of all of our past episodes in the podcast feed, or you can go to www.leancast.org. So I want to tell you about today's episode. My guests are Bet Gardner and Jeff Heil. They're from a company called Breakthrough Learning. Now, Bet is the creator of uh, a fantastic simulation called Friday Night at the ER, which I got to experience last year. I blogged about it in December. And if you want to find a link to that blog post uh, and more information, you can go to the page for this episode, leanblog.org 328. Now, when we recorded the webinar, at the time, Bet was CEO. She's the founder of the company, not just the creator of the simulation. And Jeff was the COO. Uh, But recently, they announced that Jeff is taking over the CEO role. Now, they are, as as, uh, they mentioned in the episode, mother and son. Um, So again, I mentioned we're going to have a father and son team um, in a future episode. Um, Today, we've got a mother and son talking about the use of simulations. What was Bet's inspiration for creating this? We'll talk about systems thinking and healthcare improvement. And we'll talk about how the simulation is used by organizations in all sorts of different industries as a way of um, demonstrating, learning, Um, learning to articulate and apply systems thinking principles. And I think there are, of course, very strong connections to Lean as uh, Bet and Jeff agree. So thank you uh, for listening. And here is today's episode. Well, Bet and Jeff, thank you for being guests on the podcast. How are you today? I'm great, Mark. Um, It's great to be here. Yeah, doing well, Mark. Thanks for having us. So we're, you know, I think uh, I know you both have uh, a lot to share today, and maybe we can start off. I always like to let guests introduce themselves. Um, Bet, if you could start off and you know tell the listeners uh, about yourself and some of your career path and background to start. Sure. Um, well, early in my career, I worked in healthcare policy analysis and socioeconomic research um, for maybe three, well, five years. Then I spent about 10 years in hospital management and healthcare system development before then becoming a consultant. So we're going back over quite a history here, 30 plus years. But I founded the company Breakthrough Learning to focus on the development and use of Um, innovative uh, team learning tools that could produce breakthrough results. (laughs) And um, Friday Night at the ER has become our flagship product. And and that's really, that's going to be our main topic of conversation. We'll hear about the the, the story and and how it's being used and how how you created that. And we're also joined by uh, Jeff Heil. Jeff, can you share, you know, likewise kind of share a little bit about your uh, career background and story? Yeah, sure. So uh, I have a design background. I worked on 
various products and interfaces in my first few years after college. Um, but for the last five years, I've been focused on breakthrough learning and the Friday Night at the ER product specifically. Um, I don't know if you know this, Mark, but one major reason I got into this work at Breakthrough Learning is that this is a family business that is actually my mom. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, this was an opportunity as I was beginning my career uh, that was looking to take her 25-year-old product to the next level. And mm -hmm. uh, I was interested in helping her modernize and improve it and uh, eventually manage the business, which is what I do today as COO. All right, well, great. So we'll, we'll come back to um, a little bit more of how you got involved in, in the company other than the other uh, family background. We'll, we'll come back and touch <laughs> on that. But uh, Beth, can you, you know, it's a really interesting story. I've, I've read it. I'd like to hear you um, tell the story and we'll go back and forth about it a little bit. You know, the story about creating Friday Night in the ER, the, the origins before uh, the product and the company came to be. Okay, um, sure. Well, um, Friday Night at the ER had its origins, um, as Jeff mentioned, more than 20 years ago. And it was really the result of um, several threads in my work coming together. Um, for one, I wanted to find a way to help people bring system thinking into practice in organizations. You know, at, at that time, the knowledge and the ability to apply systems thinking resided almost entirely within academic institutions, mm -hmm. business schools and such. And I felt strongly there was a need to spread the capability broadly, in particular to you know, leaders and emerging leaders in organizations and in communities. So that was one thread, a compelling purpose that I had to broadly help people apply systems thinking. Now, during this time, my consulting work included an engagement at a hospital where their emergency department was frequently overwhelmed. Um, they were having to tell paramedics to bypass their hospital very frequently because they couldn't seem to handle um, demand. Mm -hmm. So in that role, I spent time with a team of stakeholders. I created a computer-based simulation model of patient flow at that hospital and beyond it that allowed us to um, test lots of ideas and learn where in their system, the system of emergency care at that hospital as well as beyond, where were the leverage points. And it turned out that it was a powerful learning experience. We learned that just three adjustments <laughs> were needed that would in fact dramatically improve performance. And of course, interestingly, they were beyond the boundaries of that crowded mm -hmm. emergency department. Sure. It was a, you know, a systems problem that required a system solution. So, and now I'm, I'm getting to the aha moment here mm -hmm. that led me to create Friday Night at the ER, but I was on an airplane flying home to California from Boston, where I had attended a conference. Uh, it was a system dynamics conference. And at that conference, I had played a tabletop simulation called the manufacturing game. Now, I had been toying with the idea of creating some kind of experiential learning activity around system thinking. And it just hit me there on the airplane. I could create a learning tool in the form of a tabletop game that could work. So those were the threads and the sort of various inspirations that got me to this point. And, you know, sitting on an airplane, you're strapped in, you've got hours ahead of you. I simply, my mind wandered and I found myself literally sketching out the game board and the dynamic acti activity that would be Friday night at the ER on the back of a napkin. Yeah. I know that sounds like 
a cliche, but it's true. It was it's on a true. napkin. It was, that was the creative moment. Um, and so it took a number of steps following that, but just a few months really to create a prototype of the Friday night at the ER simulation game that, you know, was ready to test. And yeah. that's how it happened. And so did, did uh, the, the other kind of Silicon Valley cliche, did the, when you, when you got the company started <laughs> work out of your garage? Ah, <laughs> uh, um, I didn't work out of my garage, fortunately, <laughs> but I did have a home-based office. Um, when I started breakthrough learning, um, I had little kids and Jeff was one of them. <laughs> and, um, it was very convenient to be working out of home, to have a parent at home all the time. So that was home-based, but I'll tell you, the first um, prototype gameplay, the pilot test of the prototype, uh, was at my dining room table, where mm -hmm. I invited some friends to come and try it out. And I had literally butcher paper on the table that was drawn on, and little cards I'd made, and, you know, I had... Uh, frankly, like garbanzo beans that represented the patients and little macaroni noodles that represented the stamp. You know, it was a very just quick homegrown yeah. Yeah. Um, model. And I didn't know if it would work to achieve the objectives I had in mind, but it worked. People yeah. engaged in it. They got sucked in right away and simply uh, played out the dynamics of a team managing a hospital. They exhibited lots of behaviors that people naturally exhibit in organizations. Mm -hmm. And they actually moved from silo thinking to system thinking during the course of an hour playing the game. Yeah. So anyway, that was the first um, step. And then I, of course, did testing with other groups um, beyond my dining room table mm. group yeah. and did some you know, serious design work to create the product. And more importantly, I'll mention that Friday Night the ER, which is a you know, tabletop simulation, a game-like tool, um, it also represents um, the bigger program in which you'd use Friday Night at the ER, which includes a very importantly, a, a guided debrief of the experience yeah. so that people experience the um, scenario that we've crafted to draw out certain lessons, and then we drive home the lessons um, in several phases of a, mm -hmm. of a debrief yeah. Uh, discussion. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I thought that was all really effective when I had the chance to participate in it, um, you know, Jeff was there, our, our mutual friend Kay Hall was helping facilitate those discussions. Um, mm. Really, really great experience as, as I've blogged about, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll link to that blog post in, in the show notes. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious, maybe we just take a little bit of a detour, because systems thinking or, the or system dynamics as it was taught, is being taught at MIT is a, a subject we don't often talk about here on the podcast. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, uh, I, was, I was at uh, MIT at the Sloan School in a, a program called, uh, at the time, it was called Leaders Through Manufacturing. And so I got to take a system dynamics class. Um, you know, Peter Senge, uh, his book, The Fifth Discipline, was incredibly hot back then. You know, he came and did a, a guest lecture. Uh, John Sturman, um, Nelson Repenning, others were teaching system dynamics and, and it was done through um, I don't I don't think ironically I don't think I ever played the version called the manufacturing game but we played a tabletop um, simulation called the beer game which I think is very similar in right. terms of you know multi-stage supply chain and talking about you know uh, co complicated cause and effect relationships when there's time delays and um, and then and there was a computer simulation I don't know if uh, this is one you played but it was a simulator around the People Express airline that grew really quickly in the 80s and then very quickly um, went, went bankrupt. And, and, and so it was really, you know, for, to me, I think the one other connection I make to Lean, and then you know, I want to hear your thoughts and maybe Jeff's a little bit, that, 
you know, when you talk about breaking down silos, I think there's a common thread with Lean. Instead of looking at ER as the department, we're looking at a value stream and the flow in and out of the emergency department and um, the broader system. You know, I think there's there's ideas that um, from system dynamics that contribute in addition to lean methodology. So I was wondering if you could just share a little bit more of some of your experiences learning about system dynamics and, and other simulations, Bet, and then maybe um, I'll, I'll ask Jeff for some thoughts too. Right. Um, yeah, I appreciate hearing that background, Mark, because you know I have enormous respect for that program at the MIT Sloan School and you know the people, the individuals you, you mentioned. And mm -hmm. you know I've just been so fortunate to work with um, stellar people who are leaders in this field, and Peter Senge and John Sturman and Nelson Rapene, and you know notably Barry Richmond. Um, who was a mentor of mine. Mm -hmm. And I um, found the relevance of systems thinking just you know, compelling, as do many. And I learned about the tools and the methods and the concepts of that discipline by simply attending various conferences and workshops that were offered. I didn't do the MIT uh, program, although they have an mm -hmm. excellent two-week summer program that yeah. you can attend on learning this from the pros. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned through some self-education. I um, also learned, as I tend to do best, by application. So yeah. I had this consulting practice. I wanted to apply systems thinking. I was very excited about its use. And I um, engaged um, Barry Richmond, Mark Page, and some others to work with me to help me apply it in real time. So I brought some people in who were professionals, and I learned through them, learned by doing. And then over the course of time, various consulting engagements later, we flipped roles where I was leading the work, applying systems thinking, using those methods and tools. And... Um, one of these experts in the field was um, sort of shadowing me or simply available as a coach if mm -hmm. I was building a computer simulation model and got stuck or needed a technical boost. So I really learned by doing and by applying and I just continued to be encouraged by um, client work where people were literally having you know, breakthrough results, <laughs> yeah. you know, from doing this, you know, deeper understanding of, you know, the interrelationships in the systems in which they worked, which, you know, really helped them gain insights and ideas about making smarter decisions. Yeah. Um, and so we have breakthroughs and then breakthrough learning yeah. uh, as a <laughs> yeah. and, then, and and Jeff, you know, bring bring you back into the discussion. You know, can you talk a little bit more about maybe some of your interests in um, you know, different topics you've been exposed to here around um, systems thinking, lean, and, and 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 maybe use that as a way of telling a little bit more of the story about how you've been involved and in, and in, in improving or modernizing, updating uh, the simulation and the experience. Sure. Yeah. So uh, that was end of 2013 when I uh, initially got involved with Breakthrough Learning. And initially it was, you know, a challenge that was right up my alley with my design background to simply upgrade the product. Um, but as I came to know Friday Night at the ER and as I got into it, I got very excited about what it does for people and, and um, got exposed to this world of systems thinking. Uh, and that philosophy and the importance of that mentality um, sort of struck by how uh, generic and universal systems thinking is it applies to anything that has parts and a common purpose. And yet, you know, how human nature it is for people when they're part of a system to operate in silos and, you know, uh, be given a role and feel responsible for just a part sort of without the... Uh, um, 
the instinct to share responsibility with other parts, um, you know, generally is, is mm-hmm. hard for people in their work. And so, um, you know, I got very excited about how Friday Night at the ER can be used as a tool to help shift people's thinking um, and make impact in organizations. And so, um, you know, that has led to where I am today with the company managing in the business, uh, my role has broadened since I started uh, back in 2013. Uh, we've now built a team around this product at our office in Portland, Oregon, and working internationally with customers and partners to expand the product's use to new markets. Um, and yeah, continuously just uh, struck by um, how applicable it is um, in different settings with different companies in different industries. Uh, certainly, um, you know, applies when we're thinking about lean transformation uh, or a lean culture and what's required uh, in that culture to pull off lean. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think you, you raise a really good point there that it's normal or, you know, it's it's not unexpected for, for people to kind of hunker down in their silos for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's not... Uh, I think we're, I, I bet we're in agreement that it's, it's not their fault for practicing right. siloed thinking that, that people are most often sort of a product of their environment and the system that they're a part of. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, you or, or, or bet have any other mm-hmm. kind of reflections on how some of this is, is, is natural, um, but also creates an opportunity then to sort of break past some of that, um, some of the barriers that we put up for ourselves. Yeah, so, um, you know, just as you say, people, it's not that people don't want to perform well or have their organization perform well or, um, you know, be collaborative and sharing responsibility as an example. Um, I think one of the most interesting things that our program teaches um, that I've been exposed to, um, you know, through being a part of this company um, Mm -hmm. is this idea of structure and that that there are forces at play in organizations sometimes often (laughs) put into place unintendedly um, that are, you know, inhibiting people's ability to um, put systems thinking into practice. It's not necessarily the people or it's often not the people, um, but things in the work environment, the physical layout, the, you know, the job description they've been given, the incentive systems that people Mm -hmm. put into place. uh, culture, uh, you know, norms and, and um, mental models around kind of the way it's always been in this organization. Mm-hmm. All of these things um, contribute to the structure that may inhibit um, or drive certain behaviors. Yeah. And, and, and Beth, I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on that or some of the other lessons that, that come out from Friday night at the ER. Uh, sure. Well, just Following up on that, I'll say that this systems thinking adage, structure drives behavior, um, is an explicit design principle in the game where we've actually designed in the game certain structural features that influence people for some time during the game, really to focus on their narrow job. (laughs) So... Uh, it's not really intended as a gotcha. It's intended as a replica of what people do experience in reality in their organizations. So, you know, we assign them the role of department manager, for example. We don't say you're a team managing a hospital. We say your role is mm-hmm. to manage the department you're sitting in front of. So right away, they're kind of focused down on their department. We We draw boundaries on the game board that are boxes. You literally have to (laughs) think out of the box and act out of the box if you're going to succeed in the gameplay. But people have this, you know, unconscious (laughs) suggestion that there's a boundary there that they should stay within. We have an accounting process in the game, as you know, Mark, Mm -hmm. where people are keeping track of how many hours of waiting and delay and staff expense and so forth. And it gives people the sense that their own department performance is what's important. Whereas, again, at the end of the game, as you know, the team score is what's important. And in the game, so the dynamic we're trying to demonstrate 
is that structure drives behavior. In the debrief, we go into that, making it relevant to a group and its company, its organization. What are the structural forces that drive behavior in your organization? Yeah. Um, what inhibits people from collaborating, from innovating? And we focus on that inhibiting <laughs> side, mm -hmm. not so much what drives it, but what inhibits it, because that's yeah. where people resist change. And that's, I think, a high calling of leaders to remove some of those inhibitors. Yeah. In any case, as people play this game, um, they begin more or less siloed, very busy managing their job, their position. And over the course of the one hour gameplay, um, they, you know, pressure builds, um, performance starts looking not so good. <laughs> Um, quality indicators are heading south. And as pressure builds, which is often reflected by the buildup of waiting and backlogs in the emergency department on a busy Friday night, um, people um, find they have to collaborate across functional boundaries. And yeah. they, they have to be they have to be innovative and open to new ideas and share them among each other. They have to use the data that's available to them rather than um, instinct in the face of uncertainty about what's the best course of action here. Mm -hmm. And they have to do those things. And those three, you asked about key lessons, those three behaviors, collaboration, innovation, and data-driven decision-making making are really what we this still down in debrief as key mm -hmm. success behaviors and in the gameplay as well as in your real world. And they happen to be all derived from the discipline of systems thinking. Yeah. Um, so because our systems have made up, are made up of interdependent parts, we need to collaborate across boundaries or else the system does not perform. Yeah. Um, and so forth. The same with yeah. innovation, which rests on the power of our mental models and data-driven decision-making, um, which helps our systems learn and adapt to change and is essential for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, when I, in my experience playing the game, you know, we had, I was a mm -hmm. man, I was the emergency room manager and we had a, a step down unit. Mm -hmm. we, well, we had a surgery unit, a critical care unit, a step down unit. And let me, let me, I'll try to paint a little bit of a picture um, and, and you guys can elaborate or correct me if I have any of this wrong, but you know, there are different ways patients can flow in to the hospital, not just being mm -hmm. dropped off by ambulance or walking into the ER. There are, of course, then many possible flows of the patients can be discharged from the ER, they can be sent to any of the other units, surgery patients are sent different directions. So you have this flow of patients and, you know, it seemed like one of the key elements of gameplay is trying to balance, uh, properly balance um, staffing with patient flow, where the, the accounting and the scoring of the game makes it pretty clear that if uh, your emergency department gets clogged up and you have to go on diversion, that's really bad for patient care and there's going to be financial penalties. And, you know, it seemed like there, we're, you know, we were trying to strike a balance of being not grossly overstaffed, which would have increased our costs and been you know, punished that way, but certainly making sure we were not understaffed. And so one of the structures that comes to mind um, is that we were literally seated around a table. And so we had the ability to see each other's boxes. Um, we could communicate and collaborate. And, and, and you know, that led to a lot of reflections then about the real world around how people within a hospital or even within a broader health system don't have visibility. They don't have easy um, communication and collaboration. So that, that, I think that really challenged the attendees who were there from hospitals to think, what can they do to tra change the structure instead of um, just setting better targets for each silo or telling each silo's manager and team to do better, <laughs> changing the structure yes. um, and, and having some key principles about how you manage the operation. I think you know, our, our team 
did well relatively in the simulation. And we were proud of the fact that our goal was not making patients wait, um, as opposed to saying, well, here's our budget. That's the only staffing we can have. So we called in, you know, we were pretty aggressive about calling in staff and um, avoiding situations mm -hmm. with bad patient flow. Right. And, you know, you make a great point about, um, first of all, being able to see the hole um, where that, really was a structural influence on your behavior. Mm -hmm. You could collaborate, mm -hmm. you could communicate better. Um, you know, in a simulation, which of course is a gross simplification of reality, um, yeah. we do compress time and space so that people can see the consequences of their action. We want them to see the whole system um, and be able to see the results of their action. So as people engage in the experience, they can learn from it because, of course, learning requires understanding the consequence of our actions and adjusting our mental models and mm -hmm. then trying again to do better. But you also, Mark, of course, we're probably at a game table with other healthcare people. And I just want to point out that this game really was designed for a broader purpose of teaching, you know, basically leadership development mm -hmm. skills and uh, helping people understand what systems thinking is about, no matter what industry they're from. So um, honestly, we find people readily transfer the experience of Friday night at the ER and its lessons to their reality, whether it's, you know, a tech company or a government agency or, you know, a manufacturing company. Um, everyone brings their actual operational experience to the party. And what we do is encourage facilitators to customize the debrief for their particular group. Um, mm. The gameplay is the same across industries. Everyone finds the hospital setting somewhat familiar you know they've either yeah. been in a hospital or they've seen one of yeah. a bajillion tv shows and <laughs> you know they feel outside of healthcare. people say oh this is our lucky day we get to manage a hospital what fun and <laughs> they engage in it heartily and they learn from it just as others do i mean a bit of a very quick story to this point I recall early on using Friday night at the ER for the first time in a manufacturing company. Um, and at the end of the gameplay, um, one of the managers exclaimed, this is our company. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a great testimonial to the realism of the simulation, not the realism of what the scenario was representing, not at all representing their company or even their industry. So they were managing a hospital. Um, but the realize, realism that they were reflecting was in the basic work processes, the dynamics represented, the time pressure, you know, the challenges of workload management, resource allocation, unpredictable events, and so forth. All the things you were citing in a healthcare context, they put it in their own context and say, hey, you know, this feels real. So for that company's purpose, which was leadership development, you know, that worked for them very well. So I guess I want to just make the distinction between a simulation like Friday night at the ER that is a learning tool and is designed for broad learning across many industries yeah. and all kinds of levels within companies to a different kind of simulation, which is part of what you might have been exposed to somewhat at MIT, which is for decision support that needs yeah. to be much more operationally specific, of course, to replicate the reality of a yeah. specific company or situation. Yeah, I mean, I think you know when you say you know something is a gross simplification of reality, that 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 makes it good for learning purposes. I mean, I think you know somebody. I mean, I'm a consultant. I haven't really run an emergency department either, but um, I could see where uh, anybody who has experience in operations can understand the game and the construct of the simulation, just the same as, you know, playing 
uh, the MIT beer game. Uh, we don't know anything about running mm -hmm. a brewery or a uh, distribution company, but you <laughs> figure out the game and, and get the lessons that, that you get out of it. Because um, I've seen, you know, I've played a lot of different tabletop simulations and, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes people, I think, get bogged down in trying to make it too realistic. Um, mm -hmm. and it can, you can never make it realistic enough. It seems to be my experience. Mm -hmm. People will always <laughs> complain that it's not realistic. So, uh, you know, make it, make it good yeah. enough for learning. And, you know, hopefully people can look past that. Um, but, but Jeff, I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts of, you know, maybe some of the context in which Friday night at the ER is used in different types of organizations. Are they bringing it in as part of a kickoff for, um, let's say, a lean transformation effort or leadership development purposes? Or what types of environments do you see it, it being used in? Sure. Yeah. So first of all, as Bet was saying, uh, there are many different types of organizations using Friday Night at the ER, even outside of healthcare. So, um, you know, big global companies across industries like Disney, Intel, FedEx, and Boeing, uh, nonprofits like Habitat for Humanity and Engineers Without Borders. There's uh, government agencies around the world. Uh, here in the U.S., agencies like uh, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, CDC, and the CIA all use the game. Uh, most of these organizations um, are using Friday Night at the ER for some of the more common and general learning outcomes, things like leadership and essential skills development, cross-functional collaboration, team effectiveness, uh, things like that. There's also some more peripheral uses, like um, disaster response planning at FEMA or supply chain management in some MBA programs. Um, to give you an example, within the health sector, one of the largest healthcare systems in the world using Friday night at the ER in a leadership uh, skills certificate program, they're teaching business acumen for all of their charge nurses who need to be thinking more critically, more broadly, uh, with a deeper understanding of what it takes to manage for quality and safety and to control cost. Um, another example that's maybe more relevant to your audience, uh, there's a metropolitan hospital in, uh, here in the, in the States that's using Friday night at the ER um, or had used it to begin their lean journey uh, to help create a dialogue around changing leadership roles and shifting people's mental models to align with lean principles. Uh, sort of set the context and create an environment uh, that's conducive to to lean. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess finally I'll mention a uh, very popular use these days is in health professions education in schools and in particular interprofessional education um, as competencies like systems thinking and teamwork and communication are becoming more mainstream and expected of uh, healthcare professionals. Yeah. But yeah, as you say, uh, kicking off new teams, uh, process improvement or quality improvement teams, um, sort of setting guiding principles for, for new groups coming together, uh, orientation programs for new managers or new employees, maybe um, retreats, uh, senior leaders uh, getting together for a management or strategic planning retreat may use the game as part of that program. Um, general uh, you know, ongoing skill building and continuing education uh, courses in leadership and, and critical thinking and business acumen, as I've mentioned before, things like that. So really, really diverse in how it can be used. And as Bet mentioned earlier, um, really dependent on the facilitator sort of, uh, you know, customizing the debrief, tailoring it to the needs of the group, uh, aligning it with whatever, um, you know, uh, thereafter as far as outcomes. Yeah. And, you know, you're talking about in the, the context of, of lean and, you know, we, we have, I think a lot of people listening to the podcast, um, you know, outside of healthcare. Um, but we, you know, we, we've touched on some of the, the connections between systems thinking Friday night at the ER and in lean principles, you know, uh, Looking systemically, you know, the value stream or value streams, transparency, 
um, problem solving and being data driven? I mean, what, what are some of the other connections that, that sort of stand out most to you or to the, um, you know, the, the, the lean people who play the, uh, who, who use the game? I was saying, I was saying before uh, that, you know, there are certain things required to successfully deploy lean in a work, de in a work environment. Um, things like sharing responsibility for success of the system or uh, challenging the status quo or understanding both the details of the work and the big picture, uh, mm -hmm. data-driven and fact-based decision-making as opposed to purely instinct. Uh, the list goes on. And uh, all of these things, as it turns out, are required to optimize the performance of this hospital in our simulation game. So giving people this experience, um, you know, where they get to experience the imperative of those things, um, I think, you know, really helps um, people align themselves uh, with, with a culture, with a, um, a way of going about their work that is conducive to lean. And uh, we've had some lean experts tell us that the three core strategies from our program, uh, collaboration, innovation, data-driven decision-making, are in fact um, foundational attributes of a lean organization. Yeah. So it does, it does align. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, okay. Mark, the, um, the other thing that you know, we hear back from people uh, frequently um, is that the experiential learning that takes place through the game simply accelerates people's understanding, um, kind of moves people from an intellectual understanding of what will it take to go down, you know, to begin the learning journey, or what will it take to improve performance in our system. Mm -hmm to a more visceral understanding. And we enjoy um, seeing groups play the game and, you know, struggle a bit, mm -hmm. sometimes find their sea legs and mm -hmm. then excel. And we try to, during the gameplay, kind of drop some breadcrumbs along the way so that people do come out with some degree of success and we have facilitators who like to have groups do a lightning round as a second stage after a little debrief mm, so that yeah. they can actually see the results and their scores that improve you know in a crazy way you know 80 90 percent improvement in performance on quality and on cost and viscerally the teams get to experience the fun of collaborating at a high level and sharing responsibility for you know performance in one department even though they may be managing another department so i think that you know some of this is the learning process and the learning technique that simulation affords mm -hmm. um, as well as of course the content as jeff says matching what needs to be understood and learned yeah and then I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more sort of back to the design of, of the simulation, right? You know, how, how did you go about trying to find the right balance of being complex enough uh, without being too <laughs> challenging? Was that some of the initial kitchen table testing <laughs> that helped sort that out? I'm, I'm curious, how, 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 did you, how'd you, how'd you find that, that right point? Yeah, you know, I, that's a great question. Um, you know, what is realistically, what is realistic enough for a team to learn and uh, really engage in the exercise? And I think it really depends on the purpose of the particular simulation. I've created a number of simulations, uh, most computer-based, but also some physical ones like Friday night. And, you know, I think it's just based on the purpose to be served. Um, for me, one of the driving design objectives was a very practical one that influences how realistic you can make it. And that had to do with the time allocation I could imagine people, you know, giving to a learning experience like this. So 
the gameplay I felt, the actual simulation experience had to be limited to one hour because I wanted people to really explore much more deeply in the debrief what it meant and how to apply the lessons mm -hmm. of the game in their work. So that for me and understanding the way organizations allocate time for leadership development and training and so forth, I, I felt like a half day total was pretty much the maximum. So that sharply focused me <laughs> in terms mm. of how much complexity the game could represent. Um, mm -hmm. Well, the, it sounds like you course, had some, original, yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like you had some design objectives and some design criteria that you worked backward, backward from around some customer needs yeah. or constraints. Yeah, and again, I you know the primary design principle was to um, help people broadly understand some core concepts of systems thinking. Um, although soon after the game was released and people were using it they started using it for all kinds of things that you know it, it, it was it became very versatile um but for example in the design i'll say you know there were a number of system thinking concepts that i felt were um very on target and important for people to understand so one precept that you're aware of that most people maybe are aware of in your audience but it's a, a concept that cause and effect are often distant in time and in space. It's simply you know, one of the many concepts of this that's useful to have in mind. And what we, I did in the game design explicitly to help people realize that viscerally is um, in the gameplay during the night hours we have the manager of a unit we call step down, which is a large bed unit in the gameplay, um, restricted and unable to exit patients, to discharge patients during those night hours. Um, and they can resume exiting patients from mm -hmm. the system in the morning hours. But overnight, we're assuming that doesn't happen. Well, the very visible problem of accumulating in the game of patients waiting in for, for emergency care in the emergency department and people backlogging, waiting for transfers to other departments becomes very obvious when initially flow through the system is moving very nicely. The step down manager is very pleased with herself or himself. <laughs> managing well and when they turn over the card that says no discharges at night um there's kind of a dawning realization by that manager that you know uh-oh i think i might become part of the problem because that's the primary uh, outlet for patients to leave the system so the door closes at step down can't patients can't leave and step down starts filling up and then the prior department fills up and eventually the backlog traces back to the emergency department and causes an enormous challenge and pressure on the emergency department manager to want to divert ambulance patients, um, which as you said, is a not a good thing for quality or cost. So anyway, that dynamic is built into the game design to teach that cause and effect are often different. Think the cause is step down closing at night, the effect is all the way back to the emergency department waiting area where people are accumulating. Yeah. So sorry, that was a long-winded answer or way of explaining. There are a number of systems thinking principles such as that, that we want people to come away with. And we want people to then say, okay, I'm going to always look upstream and downstream when I'm working on a value stream and understand yeah where is the you know are the constraints and where how do we keep this you know yeah. flow moving yeah well that's great and i i really um like the experience and, and appreciate the opportunity um to to get involved as, as or to participate and and hopefully mm -hmm.
partner up and, and help facilitate this uh, for people in the future. Uh, maybe as we wrap up, Jeff, can you talk a little bit of, a little bit more about how organizations, whether they're in healthcare or other settings, how, how can they connect with, with you, with the company, with the simulation? Um, how, what, what different ways, if somebody says, I want to do this in my organization, what, what are some of the different paths to get there? Yeah, sure. So um, first of all, uh, people can um, visit our website, FridayNightAtTheER.com to learn more about the simulation. Also on the site, uh, there's information um, about how to contact us. There's phone and email uh, both listed there. Um, people can uh, often, um, you know, two things we recommend as sort of first steps. You can attend a demo and training workshop if you're interested in getting a hands-on experience with Friday Night at the ER, learning, you know, what it's like to play. And then there's an optional uh, facilitator, uh, train the trainer that happens. Um, uh, on the second day of that workshop. So that's a good option for people who need to sort of learn more and, and have an experience. We have one of those scheduled, by the way, um, February 28th uh, to March 1st in LA this year coming up and we'll be booking more as the year goes on. Um, if you're not able to make it to an in-person uh, demo and training workshop, uh, we also do a web demo uh, where we can um, show you how Friday Night at the ER works and how it might connect to your needs. Um, it's a one hour long web demo um, that can be scheduled a uh, week in advance. Um, for folks that are interested in having a, an expert uh, facilitator come out to deliver Friday Night at the ER at their organization, the process is really straightforward. We have a conversation to learn about your group, your needs and, and your learning objectives. And then we match you with one of our very experienced facilitators in our global experts network uh, to go out and deliver the program. Um, alternatively, and we see this often, uh, customers are interested in running programs on their own, uh, using the tool with an internal facilitator or consultant. And so we sell Friday Night at the ER as a game kit uh, that comes with everything you would need to lead successful programs on your own. And, uh, it's a good option if you have someone internal who's willing to learn the tool uh, and if you plan to run the program uh, more than once in your organization or with a team. So yeah. many people will just uh, own a kit and use it mm -hmm. as they need it for, for various purposes. Yeah, well, I could see that being of interest. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who um, you know, are in, internal process improvement leaders or facilitators within uh, within their organization or, or people working with organizations in, in different industries. Um, so I would encourage people to um, maybe go, you know, uh, there's no, there, there's no substitute for experiencing it yourself. We can talk about it, but <laughs> I think there's good, um, good opportunity for, for people to go and check it out. So, um, but do you have any, any final thoughts or, you know, that, that you want to share with the audience here before we wrap up? Um, no, I just uh, feel like we've covered a lot of ground and I'm happy about that. So thank you for that opportunity, Mark, and um, would love to hear from people and feel open to, uh, you know, talking with your listeners in conversations if that's of interest to um, learn more or to share their experience with other simulations and mm -hmm. Um, you know, learn from them as well. So thanks so much for the opportunity. Well, sure. Um, thank you for, uh, for, for being here. And, and maybe even the, just uh, maybe it'll, it'll spur people to go and check out uh, if, they, if they haven't read Peter Senge's uh, The Fifth Discipline or, or the Field Book, The Fifth Discipline Field Book or, or the other um, really thought-provoking, interesting uh, ideas that come out of that field. Maybe people can go check that out um, as well. So again, we've been um, joined by uh, Beck Gardner and, and Jeff Heil uh, from Breakthrough Learning. Thank you. Uh, thanks for um, joining us and, and sharing what, what you're doing. It's really been a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us on. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org.
If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com. 